Hey everyone, welcome to Founders 365 with me, Stephen Haggerty. Today, I'm joined by Mike Maynard, owner of Napier. How are you today, Mike? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on the podcast, uh, Stephen. Thank you for being here, Mike. I really appreciate your time. Uh, and like with most of my guests, let's just start off this conversation with an overview of, of what Napier is. Yeah, so um, we're a, a PR and marketing agency. Um, what we try and do is try and help our clients sell more of their products, basically. Um, so we're out there um, telling people about our clients' products, about their technologies, um, and also uh, running campaigns that drive leads and ultimately um, generate uh, opportunities for them. Um, the big uh, focus for us, though, is um, high technology business to business products. So it's all about selling to other businesses and it's all about tech. So we're very focused on a particular niche area. Love it. And that's what makes things work. As we've, as we've learned in the marketing world, if you don't niche, you're not going to work. Let's put Absolutely. it that way. Absolutely. Let's uh, let's rewind then. How did you get involved with Napier? Because uh, I know that you you purchased it rather than founded it. So I'm always interested with these kind of stories. When you know what was going on for you to think this is something I need in my life? Yeah, it's it's um, it's an interesting story. So um... <laughs> buckle your seatbelts, kids. <laughs> yeah. My, my career, I, I knew, I know people who have like five year, 10 year career plans. I mean, I was lucky to have a five minute career plan. <laughs> um, so I started off as an electronics engineer. I was designing electronic systems. Um, I designed mixing desks. That was really cool for recording studios. Cool. I designed systems that made printing rollers with, you know, huge, great lasers that were burned through brick. That was cool as well. So um, proper like boys toys. It was you know, like proper exciting stuff. Um, but then I realized actually maybe it wasn't really what I was really good at. Um, and I found that um, a lot of the, the kind of admin behind being an engineer, I wasn't particularly good at. Some of the ideas and the creativity and the, the concepts I, I really enjoyed. I think that's true of most engineers. Um, but what I decided to do was move into a technical support role. They called it field applications in, in electronics. Um, then working for an American company, I realized, you know, I was running the field applications business in Europe, wasn't really anywhere for me to go, um, unless I moved to the States and I wanted to stay in the UK. So I moved into marketing. Um, and that's where I made my genius career move of being <laughs> sent on a management training course. Oh, classic. Um, and, uh, I was sent on this management training course and I, I think it taught me lots of good things. Um, but the thing I actually remember was um, the last evening, we all you know, got together, had a few drinks, um, and someone said to me, you should really start your own business, Mike. And, um, I and kind of, was, that, was that just not a consideration before that? Um, it, it was something I, I'd kind of thought of, but I'd yeah. never really thought seriously about it or put any plans into place. No, it, yeah. it was something that, that was kind of a bit left field. Um, and I kind of assumed they were actually saying, well, actually, Mike, I'd never, ever want to manage you. You'd be a nightmare. But I, th I think they put it across fairly nicely. So I took the positives. Um, and then about two months later, um, the agency that I was using, uh, the founders decided they wanted to sell. Interesting. Um, so I decided can't be that hard to run an agency. <laughs> I've never done uh, it before. I've never worked. Classic. How, hard can, yeah. <laughs> How hard can it be? How hard can it be? Um, as it turns out, if you buy an agency that's 100% focused on tech and you start with them about three weeks before the dot-com crash hits, mm. it's really, really hard. So, one. Yeah, so uh, timing wasn't great, but, um, you know, that, that's how I got there, basically, was, uh, was uh, someone saying, you know, you should do this, and then having an opportunity, I felt, you know, was, it. was an ideal one for me. And thrown in at the deep end then, in terms of the timing and and obviously just not being in that role before as well in terms of moving into that business owner role having that responsibility how did you find that adjustment uh in those early days when you first sort of took took the helm as it were i i mean that's uh that's a great question because it, there was so many things going on so um you have this transition from, you know, what I thought would be a fairly easy transition. I thought, you know, I'm employing agencies. I must know what people want from agencies. 
actually when you're you know working with an agency and, and you've got an agency you know working for you you don't really understand what makes you happy i think um mm. so you don't necessarily understand how to really uh, make the clients happy um there was learning you know internal systems and processes and things like that and then there was just the dot com crash which um in terms of um you know recessions was probably the worst we've been through as an agency um and you know i, I remember at one point we had to replace the phone system because I bought an agency with a phone system that basically didn't work anymore. Um, so we we're replacing the phone system. The new phone system didn't work either. You know, it's kind of the way things were going. Nothing worked. <laughs> and at one point, you're sensing the pattern, and you're going right. What's, yeah, what's happening? Yeah, yeah. It's like you know, don't buy a lottery ticket this week. You're not going to win. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, um, you know, I remember vividly at one point. You know, the phone wasn't ringing because it wasn't working. I just turned. I said. Well, at least nobody can fire us by phone anymore <laughs> because all these clients were all freaking out. And, and obviously, you know, for them, it was a disaster as well, yeah, because a yeah. lot of them were in this, you know, high tech communications. They were under pressure. We we're under pressure. It, it was a, a tough situation. Mm. It, it's, it's, I think whenever people go through that, those kind of times and that, that situation, Communication is always the number one factor. Uh, the fact you didn't have a working phone back then probably meant that your communication <laughs> style wasn't great. But what I'm curious about is is what you said in terms of the fact because you were hiring an agency, you assumed you knew what agencies did and, and how to make other clients happy, right? Uh, and that perhaps wasn't the easiest case as you may have first thought. How did you then solve that how did you start figuring out what people wanted and and how can napier sort of fit in with those solutions for that people because you're still around which is fantastic to see uh, and you know you've gone through growth and other exciting things so you must have just gone right it's time to me to to put my solution head on uh, and let's crack on yeah and i think at the time you you kind of just work through the problems. I mean, there's there's what well, feels like this never ending list of problems. And, you know, you kind of triage it, you identify the, you know, the top issues, you work through them. And, you know, one area in, in terms of you know, understanding what clients want, you know, ultimately, you just got to ask people. Mm. I mean, you ask clients what they want, they tell you um, what they think they want. And, and a lot of it's, you know, actually important stuff, but it's yeah. not necessarily the whole story. Um, so then you've got to talk to other people in the agency and learn from people who are, you know, who are working for you effectively um, and get them to teach you as well. So I think it's it's just about gathering as much information as possible. And for you, if we now fast forward a little bit, marketing in general, I think, has just exploded. Uh, and it And it seems like, you know, every man and their dog either has a has a marketing company or wants to start a marketing company. How has that been for you being, you know, being around for a little bit longer, adjusting to newer times, but more importantly, I think, adjusting to the fact that consumers and customers, clients, have much more awareness in terms of what's on offer now, as opposed to 10, 10 plus years ago? Yeah, I mean, the world of marketing has changed completely. I think, you know, probably um magazine publishers are, are probably the only business that's changed more um so magazine. Think, people will be now thinking what's a magazine i wonder yeah. that's scary yeah. it's, it's like an lp you can read yeah. <laughs> do you remember cassettes yeah <laughs> so um you know today there, there's a lot more complexity in marketing mm. um there's always been a very low barrier to entry to open a marketing agency. I mean, literally all you do is you put up a website and say we're a marketing agency. Um, and that's always been the case, but that's very different from being a good marketing agency or being able to, um, you know, go and win business. We bring clients is something different. We bring them a lot of experience, we bring them mm. a lot of expertise as well um, that you wouldn't get with someone just opening, you know, a, a one man business. Um, for sure, there are companies um, that, you know, do really well and start off. And, you know, actually, I'll be honest, you know, in our business, we, we absolutely use freelancers. So um, from that point of view, 
they're not the sort of people who you know can't do great work they absolutely can but sometimes they can't deliver a big complex project because there's just one of them mm. um, and they have other clients whereas you know with us there's 35 of us we're in a much better position to deal with very very big and you know frankly sometimes quite demanding clients yeah definitely i think people the way people view running a business now as well is, is considerably different uh, and having that mix of using you know being able to use freelancers but having that core team that you can know and, and you can rely on and you can trust and also the fact that clients get to know as well because I think businesses now no matter what industry it is really strive well cons clients and customers really strive to have a better connection with who they're working with especially when we talk about marketing because there is just so much noise out there now that mm -hmm. if you can become that no that classic you know no like and trust situation then you kind of got it sorted for you you know growing this business and being at again being at that helm what are some of the things that you've learned about yourself being in this role and being this this person that pushes the business forward uh, so many things. Um, <laughs> How long we got? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I, I mean, starting off, um, you know, one of the things that's always been a challenge for me is delegation, um, and particularly in terms of projects I'm interested in. Um, so I think, you know, in terms of a, a management challenge, it's, it's understanding how to delegate that work down because, you know, it makes no sense if you've got a, a team of 35 fantastic people and you go, no, I'm doing all of this myself. Yeah. Um, so, you know, one of the things I try and do is, is delegate down some of the things that I find most enjoyable. Um, because once you start delegating those, believe me, the things you don't find enjoyable then become very easy to delegate. <laughs> then, if I'm not doing that, I'm definitely not doing that. Yeah, a hundred percent. That's so, such yeah, a that's, common thing though, delegation yeah. and in terms of being a good manager, a good leader. What, why do you think people struggle with it? Why do you think people struggle to delegate? even the even the bad stuff sometimes i i mean the truth is that the first time you delegate stuff it normally takes longer and it normally is lower quality um and and a lot of people you know they do they try it once they try and explain to someone they come back and they haven't quite got it it's not quite right they just go oh it's not worth it i could do it myself quicker mm. um and the answer i think is always with delegation you can do it the first time quicker yourself um, but by the time you come to the fifth time or the tenth time, actually, they may well be doing it better than you, um, and they may well be doing it quicker than you. Um, so it, it's about being able to get through, you know, what I think someone like Seth Godin would call um, the dip. You know, you you you, you go through you're excited about delegating, then there's all these problems. You've got to basically grind through that, yeah. and then you start getting the benefit. Well, it's, it's it's one of those examples as well when you first did the task that you're trying to delegate now you also weren't perfect at it even oh, no, though we may e even, absolutely brilliant <laughs> even though we may think that we were brilliant at it let's face it if we look back in time if we were fly on the wall you probably made some mistakes Mike, yeah, absolutely um, totally agree. one of the things i was really interested to talk to you about was you obviously have a keen interest in uh how do i phrase this keep keen interest in sort of keeping the industry as a whole sort of very in tune, very up to date, because you, you, you lecture, you're involved in some, um, what's the word, groups, outside groups, mm -hmm. industry groups. Why yeah, is that sort of thing important for you in terms of keeping your finger on the pulse, educating others, uh, and being that person that's in that position? Yeah, I mean, that's a great point, because, you know, you mentioned marketing's changed so dramatically, it's still changing a lot. Um, so, yes, there's there's some outside areas, and you know, one of the things I guess I found is I quite enjoy training people. I'm not very good at it, working on that, but um, quite enjoy training people um, and seeing people develop. So, from that point of view, it's um, you know, it's interesting. But the more information you get from outside, the better your internal training can be. Um, and for us, you know, we've realised that that fundamentally at the moment one of the things that's going to determine how successful we are is how good our internal training is mm. um, because I can have someone who was brilliant at email marketing three years ago I can tell you today they're not going to be brilliant because they're not going to know about the latest 
tools and techniques and approaches and research. And so you've got to keep learning. Um, and in fact, we do. We have a, you know, every Friday we have a lunch and learn and we um, have somebody present something to the team um, that's going to help them develop their skills um, as well Love as having that. individual learning. I'm going to put you on the spot here now then. So what's been the, over the last couple of weeks or months, what's been the most, the biggest thing you've learned from a, a lunch and learn session? Oh, from a lunch and learn session? That's a great question. Um, so I think um, looking back in terms of the, the lunch and learn sessions, we've had a couple um, that have been focused around process, which has been very interesting. So like most companies, we have standard operating procedures and we're trying to improve that. And I worked with Clive who presented um, the, the new um, handbook systems we have. Um, and actually, I learned a lot through working with Clive about how we need to develop those systems. Um, and then I think there's there's lots of different little bits you pick out. I mean, Hannah from our team, she presented on um, uh, employee ad advocacy. So having your employees promote your business. Um, and, and that was great, you know, and, and to be able to see how not only companies are trying to encourage employees, but how they're actually structuring that and how they're making yeah. it easy. So it, it, I don't think it's necessarily one big thing, but lots of little things have really contributed. No, that's great. I mean, the reason I asked that is because it really shows that you're, you're really open to learning yourself because a lot of companies, and no matter, no matter what the size is as well, which I find sometimes put on these sort of lunch and learn situations, but then the, per the, the the leader, the manager, the founder, the owner doesn't think that they're in the position to learn themselves. But, you know, case in point, you are open to learn and you're open to adapt and you're open to change, which just shows actually why you've been around for so long uh, and why you've built such a strong, strong business. Because also there's not many companies like yours that have the sort of structure and feedback in that place either which is fantastic to see for you mike what is what's next where are you taking napier where what are you what's your plans and on top of this question have they changed because of the worldwide 2020 shitstorm <laughs> um yeah just a bit <laughs> <laughs> just a little change yeah so get through 2020 is probably the the Go first one step. Yeah, I mean, that, that's that's absolutely been a big challenge for us. And it's been a big challenge for pretty much everybody. Um, so I don't think we're any different there. Um, what we did, we, we've actually acquired two other agencies. Um, wow. The most uh, recent one being uh, back in January 2019, when we acquired an agency that was roughly the same size as Napier. So it was a, it was a really big um, uh, sort of acquisition. Um, and we ran the two agencies somewhat separately. Uh, and we just in the start of September, we've, we've decided to bring the two agencies together, merge them together, um, primarily because there's so much good talent in both companies that to like isolate it to one side or another just, just seemed wrong. Mm. Um, so we're rebuilding the, well, we've rebuilt the structure of the company. We've got a new organization. Everything is new this month. So. I mean, for me, you know, hopefully it's not going to take a huge amount of time, but my goal at the moment is to make that reorganization work um, and to make sure people are doing things they like to do within the business. Yeah, um, definitely. You know, so it, it, it's about really getting a, us into truly one business um, as opposed to, if you like, two separate kind of competing, kind of collaborating agencies um, that had a lot of positives, but also had some some downsides as well. Yeah. What's really interesting is that you, you've you obviously gone through growth via acquisition. What what made you cho choose that route rather than going, look, this is what these guys are doing. Let's try and do it better than them, which is a lot of what other people do. And then you've gone, actually, let's try and acquire them because we can see that their assets are really beneficial for us as well. Yeah. So in terms of growth, we've actually grown slightly more organically than we have through acquisition. Um, so we've, we've not forgotten organic growth at all. Um, and that's been an, an important part of the business, but, yeah. um, one of the things, um, that you find with, with agencies, particularly agencies that are specialized is you sell on a specialization. Um, and if you're any good at it, 
what happens is bigger and bigger companies start working with you and eventually you you know you, you get to work with one of the biggest companies in the, in the business um and then they start saying well you can't have competitors mm. so you're then kind of locked into one big client um and it's actually somewhat hard to jump into other um sectors so actually acquiring agencies in adjacent sectors makes a lot of sense so you know napier historically um, has been particularly strong in electronic components and semiconductors and so we've got some great clients there um, we have clients all over the place i mean we work with um, the world's largest manufacturer of baggage handling systems for airports <laughs> an example you know so completely unrelated but, but we've got a mix of um of clients and um, the most recent acquisition armitage was very very strong in industrial automation um, and control systems and so that let us bring in that side of the business very, very quickly. Whereas to grow in, in a new market um, as an agency can actually take mm. a very, very long time. So it's it's about speed, but it's definitely about not forgetting that organic growth. Yeah, 100%. Um, and for sure, we're, you know, we're very focused now on stabilizing the business, making sure that we've got everything in place um, and then getting organic growth from the acquisition. Yeah, I, I always think it's such an interesting strategy with acquiring uh you know competitors and colleagues that side of things because like you said it's a really great way to speed processes up it's a really great way to if we come back to that learning side as well it's a really great way to tap into often extraordinary talent that perhaps wouldn't be readily available uh so it's really really interesting that you're doing that for for you mike you know what i'm really one of my i guess one of my final questions would be um in terms of napier as a brand uh and as as business and like we like early days you this you weren't in business how has it changed your outlook in life how has it changed the way you live life as opposed to perhaps before big question i know big question wow um that that is the the big you know life the universe and everything question. <laughs> the, what a, the sixty million dollar question. <laughs> um, if I'm to be honest, I think it's changed my life much less than you'd expect in terms of running a business. I think that's a really positive thing. If someone's thinking of you know either acquiring a business or being a founder, um, actually it doesn't mean you can't do other things. It doesn't mean that you're stuck. Um, you know, doing the business all the time. It, it, it doesn't mean you lie awake every night, some nights, but not every night. Um, so to me, in a way, it's not really changed my business hugely, or my life hugely. Um, I travel less, which is something I wanted to do. At one point, I was basically traveling around Europe every week, and that was, that was tough. That was hard. Um, so that was perhaps one change in terms of, of life changes. But other than that, you know, I still play, well, actually, I've started playing cricket since, since I, I um, uh, took over Napier, badly. Um, <laughs> that was in the contract. You have to play cricket <laughs> to run Napier. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it was just something I used to play as a child. And I, I, I always, I said to my son, I said, you know, because he was mad keen on cricket as he grew up. And he said, you know, will you play a game when I get into the adult team? I said, right, I play one game. <laughs> uh, that was probably about five or six years ago and you know it's <laughs> um so you know I, I i still have hobbies i still do things outside um i don't you know i don't feel from a a life kind of point of view it's necessarily hugely different mm. um, that's that's great to hear really because yeah. i think being a being a founder or being someone at a, a fairly senior level of a business or, or company there's there's always that out external pressure, I think, to, you know, be the brand, be the business, you know, 24 hours, 24 seven of your life, that is what you do. Uh, and I definitely back in probably, what is it, 2016, 2017, when Gary V was all about sort of the hustle and that sort of thing, it, it really bred that dangerous mentality of you've got to have those sleepless nights you've got to make sure that you don't have any other hobbies and all this kind of stuff when actually now what i'm seeing as well speaking to obviously a lot of founders is that the balance is is really what makes the business work the fact that you can go and play cricket and the business is going to be okay and obviously you've set that up to make it okay as well you know you're not a one man band you've got a lovely team so you know that things are going to keep running when you're playing cricket, for example. 
and I'm not saying you're playing cricket all day every day. <laughs> just to just to clarify, uh, but it's really nice. Like that, it's very very short. It's not a long period of time. <laughs> but it's just really nice to hear that you, you've got that balance, and I think without that, then obviously business would be hindered, and people in general would really not be connected to the business as perhaps they are. Yeah, I mean, I think the 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 big difference is, you know, when I worked for someone else, the boss made stupid decisions. Um, <laughs> Now the boss makes stupid decisions. I'm just not quite so loud about highlighting them. You know, it's <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. No, that's you begin to appreciate, I think, some of the the reasons why people might make wrong decisions. Um, mm. But when you start running your own business, it's a it's an interesting situation to be in. And it's also interesting if you know you're making those wrong decisions or not, uh, and yeah. or when you find that out anyway, and who tells you, yeah. which is always an interesting one. Listen, Mike. I, I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation and my very final question is is how can people find out more about Napier uh, and perhaps connect with you as well? Yeah, great. So um, very welcome to come to the website. That's napierb2b.com. Um, we're very focused on business to business, so napierb2b.com. Um, you can obviously find me on LinkedIn. Uh, so just search for Mike Maynard Napier um, and you should find me. Um, and uh, we're also starting a podcast, so we've, uh, we're in early days of our, our podcast. We're, we're, we're now finally catching up with the world. Um, so we have um, a podcast called Marketing B2B Technology. Um, so again, if people want to you know, hear what we're doing, and, and I'll be honest, you know, I'm doing the podcast so I can talk to interesting people and learn stuff from them. Yeah. Um, so the guest list may seem a bit bizarre and eclectic, it's stuff I want to learn about. So yeah. um, from that point of view, hopefully it's, it's an interesting podcast. I mean, you talk about your guest list. My guest list is is just yeah. incredibly random founders from all different industries, but it's mm. exactly that. It's the learnings you get from speaking to people and asking questions is incredible. Uh, and yeah. the reason I did it is because actually the founders themselves kind of all have the same role in terms of like on paper in business. But it's the who they are, the how they do it, and everything like that, which makes it so special. Uh, and I've loved it. So I'm re I'm going to listen to yours, and I'm going to learn some, some things. And I really hope you enjoy that journey, because it's a very interesting one to go down. Cool. Thank you, Stephen. Mike, listen, thank you so much for coming on Founders 365. And uh, I wish you all the best in the future. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone, for listening and watching. This has been Founders 365.